let's begin. So good day, everyone. My name is Matthew Hirschowski of Red Hat Research, and I would like to welcome you to the next iteration of the Red Hat Research Days event. So let me introduce our speaker for today. Our two main speakers come from Graz University of Technology in Austria. Please welcome Daniel Gross and Moritz Lipp. In addition to them, we have another guest today. Uh, our conversation lead will be Red Hat's own John Masters. And having said that, I'm going to give the word to our speakers and wish you all a pleasant experience. Okay, welcome to uh, the talk uh, about uh, Platypus, um, power side channels in software. If you want to zoom in on the slides, use the three dots uh, up uh, in, uh, I think in this corner up there. Uh, don't use the one on the, on the bottom because otherwise you will see all the speakers all the time. So uh, the one with the slides is the nicer one. Um, yeah, we are talking about this power side channel attack in software. And uh, we are two presenters today. We have Moritz Lipp. Hi, I'm Moritz Lipp. I'm a PhD candidate at Graz University of Technology, and I will defend my thesis hopefully in August. If you have questions after the talk, you can write me on Twitter or an email and we can continue the discussion. Yes, so he will be on the job market then uh, looking out for, for something to break or something to uh, make more secure. Um, I'm also uh, presenting in this talk and uh, I'm an assistant professor at Graz University of Technology. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I already uh, do as a as a uh, career plan. Um, so let's talk about side channel attacks. Um, Moritz, we we worked a lot on side channel attacks in the past, um, and what we usually see there is that uh, even bug-free software can be affected by these side channels. Yes, and the important thing is that despite there are no vulnerabilities in the software, the hardware can still leak information. And we can exploit this leakage through side effects. For instance, through the power consumption of a device. So I have an idea how we do that because we, okay. we at uh, our institute, we have worked with side channel attacks for uh, basically 20 years, right? And uh, we know how things work. At least we are taught how things work in lectures. And it's pretty much like this. So this is how I envision us doing this research. Uh, so first we steal the victim's device, right? Mm -hmm. And on this device, there's some sensitive key material and that we want to get out. So we take a probe and then we measure the energy consumption uh, during computation. And that okay. can be a power side channel attack, right? And then we recover the secret key from the power trace, as you can see here, and that's it, profit. That sounds very reasonable, but I think we have no clue what we are talking about. Because we have no idea how to use any of those oscilloscope. And even Daniel, while illustrating, showed that to you. Because he used a soldering iron instead of a probe. So I, I don't think we can really do this that way. But I have an idea. Because okay. as software engineers, we can write software. And what we did in the past and maybe we can still do it in the future is we can exploit the hardware from the software. Okay, so I would say let's get started. Uh, how can we do that? Is there anything in the software level that we can use to, to measure power of a CPU? Yes, so first of all, you need to understand that my clicker doesn't work as expected. Okay. <laughs> So there are multiple ways that you have that you can save power for your CPU. For instance, the most obvious one is that you can just shut down resources that you do not need. So for instance, if there's a microarchitectural element that you just need from time to time, you can just shut it down if you don't need it. You can also reduce the voltage with the core is running on, or you can just reduce the frequency of your core. And by doing that, you can save power. And this is yeah, quite interesting. But this is for saving power. This is nothing about uh, measuring power. 
Yeah, but, but, but wait. We need to understand that we want to save power. And in order to do that, we would also need to know how much energy we have consumed. And all those properties we need, for instance, for platform thermal management. Because if your CPU runs too hot, you want to be able to control it so that it consumes less power, thereby produces less heat, so you can still continue computing on your machine. Mm -hmm. In other scenarios, you want to limit the power consumption of the device. For instance, in the cloud, where you budget your customers on their energy consumption. And I, I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about this uh, power limiting feature, Intel yes. Grapple, running average power limit. Yes. And this is basically the feature that provides this. It uh, allows you to limit the power consumption over time. And at the same time, it also enables yeah, somewhat accurate energy readings. Yes, yeah. because of course, if you want to limit the power, you should also know how much energy you have consumed. So this goes hand in hand that you are able to read it. Mm -hmm. And the way this is implemented is that you can limit the power for different energy domains and also um, observe the energy consumption of different domains. For instance, for the package or the power plane PP0 and PP1, the DRAM, for instance, the DRAM controller, how much energy it consumed, mm -hmm. or also the entire system environment. And mm -hmm. okay. it's quite easy to read that because there are MSRs that can be read by the operating system. So you can just but go there how, and read how, them out. How does that fit in a threat model, right? You're, if you're the operating system, what would be there to attack? Yeah, but wait, there's another feature. You can either read it from the operating system or unprivileged from user space. Oh, OK. OK, so this is a, I see the problem now. So, so on Linux, I can just go and, and read this file here in the sysfs. Yes. And it would tell me how much energy my CPU currently consumed? Exactly. And OK, but this is, this is a Linux vulnerability, right? Not exactly, because on macOS and Windows, you would need to install a driver, and then you would have this interface. But Graham Sutherland on Twitter posted that he found other Windows drivers that also expose this MSR to unprivileged user space. So okay. even on Windows, you would get access to that. So, so what we have is an unprivileged power meter. Exactly. And we, we don't need this physical access anymore as before. Yeah, this is great because I can now just run this from my computer at home. So I don't need it's to software. disassemble anything. Exactly. But there's one downside from that interface. Okay. The refresh rate is pretty low. So for instance, an oscilloscope it just has an update of on one millisecond. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have no idea what we can really do with this. So it sounds mm -hmm. nice, but can we actually exploit that? That's the next question, I think. Yeah, and I think you looked at uh, the power consumption there for different instructions, right? And yes. that was the first interesting observation, as we can see here on this plot. So we compare here different, um, uh, different instructions and we observe how much energy was consumed when running these instructions. And as we can see, they have different energy profiles. Mm -hmm. But it does not really stop here because what we can also do is we can observe depending on the operands, one individual instruction, for instance, here an integer multiplication consumes. As we can see, depending on the Hamming weight, which means how many bits of the operand are set to one, we can see a difference in the energy consumption. So the more bits that are set in the operand, the higher the energy consumption is, as you can see on the red spike, in contrast to the blue plot where none of the bits is set. But isn't this highly problematic? I mean, if I now have a secret and work with the secret, then I would see differences in the energy consumption just based on the secret operand. Yes. So if you can really target to measure one individual instruction, then you would get this information out. But usually you would not use um, secrets with any instruction, but usually with some instruction that is secure and you would just load it from memory 
and then basically work with secure instructions. I would, maybe AES instructions, they would probably be secure, right? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but we also looked at that. So in another experiment, what we did is we just continuously loaded a single memory location and had a different value stored at that memory location. And as we can see in this plot, also depending on the Hamming weight of the actual data that is stored at the memory location, we can deduce some information of the value that's stored there. So the more bits that are set, the higher the energy consumption is. But this is highly problematic because now I can't store secrets on my system anymore. Yes, you should store them on a post-it note on your screen, maybe. <laughs> probably, probably not, right? Probably not. Um, okay, so the energy consumption of different load values make a difference. But we also look at uh, how this interferes with the, or, or how this interacts with the caches, right? So whether uh, a load is a cache hit or a cache miss also makes a difference. And this is something that we know. We, we were working with cache attacks all the time, so we can build a cache attack with that. Let's, let's do that. Yes, and it's important to note here, as I said earlier, there are different domains where we can measure the energy consumption from. And in this case, we just measured the DRAM domain. So we can see if there is a cache miss, the DRAM controller has to do more work and thereby consume more energy. And this is what we can observe on the screen. This is very nice. Okay, so let's exploit this. Yes. So the most easiest example, if you have a side channel like this, is to build a cover channel out of that. Mm -hmm. And a cover channel is a communication channel between two parties that are otherwise not allowed to communicate. So we are not allowed to use any sockets or other means of communication. And in this example, click, we leverage the power. It doesn't work, right? The click. Yeah. <laughs> so to, just for the audience, we are sitting in different buildings in, in yeah, our yeah, city. Yeah, kilometers <laughs> apart, and sometimes his clicker doesn't reach my computer. Exactly. <laughs> so in that case, what we want to do is we want to leverage this power side channel using this Rubble interface to establish some covered communication. And the easiest way to do that is we have two processes, a sender and a receiver. And the sender, in order to send a one bit, it performs just uh, energy consuming instruction. For instance, AVX instructions. On the other hand, if he wants to send a zero, he just does nothing. He idles around. And the receiver then uses the Rappel interface to measure the consumed energy consumption. And by that, he can deduce a transmitted bit. And as we can see here in this plot, it's quite easy. So if we look at the time and the power trace that we observed, in the beginning, we are sending two ones, then a zero, again, two ones, three zeros, two ones, and so on. And it's clearly easy to distinguish those two cases and thereby receive the data. But how does that make any sense? I mean, I'm running software on a system, and now I can send data to different software on the same system. Can I just write it into a file, into a pipe, anything? That depends on, on your threat model and your use case, if you're even able to do that. For instance, look at mobile phones, where they are rather restricted in what they can access. And they want to do it okay. covertly, so no one can observe that. Mm -hmm. But so it's also you're right. not limited to processes, then? Yes, exactly. You can also communicate across other borders between yes. isolation domains. So there's a completely different use case where you can have this. And this is in the cloud, for instance, with the Xen hypervisor. What they had in earlier versions is that as a guest virtual machine, I have access to those registers. So as a guest, I can also monitor the energy consumption of the CPU I'm running on, and thereby also what other guests are doing on the same machine. And what we did to showcase this, we also established a cover channel between two guests on the Xen hypervisor. Oh, and very, here, very nice. here in our plot, which doesn't appear, we just it appears. <laughs> interchangeably it send it once, works. <laughs> ones and zeros, as you can see. So up and down and up and down in the energy consumption, which is the signal that we, that we sent. Mm -hmm. 
but, but it's only one ADEX scenario where we can yeah. use this REPL interface. And this is also, it's a very, it's, it's more artificial attack, right? Where you have yes. both the sender and the receiver under control and the exchange commu communication data, yeah. But if we want to attack, let's say the operating system, maybe we could use the side channel there as well. Uh, to figure out some secrets of the operating system. Yes. And one secret that operating systems, but also hypervisors today have, is the randomized offset that they use for KSLR, for kernel address space layout randomization. This is secret, right? Yes. But as a user space attacker, as we've seen, we have access to this Rappel interface. So maybe we can also exploit the energy consumption to de-randomize KSLR. Mm -hmm. And if we do that successfully, we can maybe mount an attack that needs this address information that we get from that. So and we will measure the differences here between mapped addresses, for instance, and unmapped addresses. Exactly. So, some of them reach the DRAM or not, or is it relevant which domain we yes. exploit so, here? So the idea is the following. We want to observe the, a difference between mapped and unmapped addresses. A uh, mapped address is where we have a physical address corresponding to the virtual address that we observe. And on Intel CPUs, for instance, what they do is, if there's a valid address translation, so the present bit is set, these translations are cached in the so-called translation look-aside buffer. So a subsequent access will be served from the DLB and therefore be fast. For a not present page, the page table walker has to repeatedly figure out the mapping and figure out that it's not present and therefore consume more energy. And this is like the basic idea how we want to de-randomize KSLR. So this seems pretty much related to the case before where we looked at cached and uncached addresses, just this time with the TLD. Yes. So the Linux kernel, uh, actually doesn't use that many different locations. Actually, uh, only 512 different locations usually on a 64-bit system because it um, uses these two megabyte pages here. And two megabyte pages, you can't have that many offsets because they are so large. So that's nine bits of entropy. Um, and this is basically what we break then. Exactly. So what we do is for each possible location, we measure whether we have um, a high energy consumption or a low energy consumption. And as you just explained, then either the translation has been cached in the TLB or it was not. And then it's the slow case where it performs the page table walk. Mm -hmm. I can totally imagine that. So what does the attack then look like? Yes, so if we illustrate that, we have different pages we want to probe. And so we just measure and access to this instruction. And we do this for every offset, as you outlined. There are only 512 of them. And we will see the same energy consumption. Only for the case mm -hmm. where the actual Linux kernel is mapped, the translations are stored. Therefore, we require less energy, which we can see in the trace. And ah, this is very nice. Can you show us a demo of this? Yes, because this is just an illustration. Of course, we ran that on a, one of our machines. And as we can see, it runs pretty fast, how we measure that. And uh, I, I can't read the exactly offset address FFFFF8E. Yeah, there, the kernel the is stored. Nice you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, so exactly where Daniel's head is, we see a, a decrease in the energy consumption. And this is where our Linux image is mapped. But sounds good. That's just uh, a KSLR break, right? Yes, and real side channels have to prove that you can leak real data, real secrets. And what can there be that is more secret than a crypto key? So we want to leak actual crypto keys. Yes, and one of those cryptographic algorithms that they are to attack is, of course, RSA, which is widely used in a public key crypto system. The idea is mm -hmm. quite simple. You have a public key that you can use to encrypt data that you can then only decrypt again with your private key. But if we get the private key, it's profit. Maybe, Daniel, you can illustrate how RSA is implemented usually. 
Exactly, because that goes very far into the theory. And we know that RSA is based on um, exponentiation modulo uh, some number. So what we do here is we, we have this uh, message here for the uh, decryption. We use uh, the ciphertext to, with the exponent d modulo n, and then we would get the decrypted message. Uh, this would be the same as uh, the um, signing operation in RSA. And what we do here is uh, we basically take this exponent, this is a, the so-called square and multiply algorithm uh, that we can use to implement this modular exponentiation. And what we do is we take this exponentiation bitwise, and if it's a one, then we perform a square and multiply. Oh, no, my picture ends here. <laughs> square and multiply. And in the other case, we only perform a square if it's a zero. And by doing that, we perform actually this modular exponentiation. So it performs two different operations based on whether it's a zero or a one in this secret exponent that we don't have as the attacker, but we want it. And I think you all seen it's the same pattern as before. There are two cases, the zero bit and the one bit. And we do in one case only one operation and in the other case, two operations. So obviously our assumption is that when we do two operation, we will consume more energy than if we do only one operation. So, and if you measure that, what, what is the result of that then, if you measure it? Yeah, you get the key. Oh, and I here, can't see the key. Yet. And, no, and, no, and, and here, we, key. here we did that. I don't and see the key. It, it's just many, many recorded power traces, which we average to get rid of the noise. And you can obviously see the private RSA key there. I, I can't see the RSA key here. Yeah, the, the truth is, that we can only recognize large blocks of ones and zeros. So there's not only one bit set to one, the next set to zero, it's like 32 bit set to one, 32 bit set to zero, and so on. Yeah, but I mean, how large is such an RSA key? 128 bits? Yeah, but anyway, an RSA Ho hopefully key more, I guess. Th does not really look like this, where like half of the bits are set and the other half is not. So, right, yeah. So maybe this is not a realistic attack at all. Yeah. Maybe this it, is it, all it, just a conspiracy and there is nothing behind the platypus attack, just maybe the case of our break. Yes. But no. <laughs> okay. So, so so how how do you do that then? Yeah. So, how do you uh, measure this precisely? So, so, so on a side note, this, this was actually the, the way we proceeded through our paper and how we did the experiments that we started with failure and continued to finally, hopefully get a key. So our first assumption was that, of course, we need to read from this file, then go to the operating system, handle that, read the MSR, everything is getting returned. So we have a large measurement overhead just by using this driver. So the so idea this is introduces, this introduces a lot of noise. Then as exactly. Well. So we need way more measurements. We need to align those traces. This is getting harder and harder. So we had the idea we use the MSRs directly and then attack from the operating system. From the operating system. Yes. But we talked about that in the beginning from the operating system doesn't make any sense because the operating system is the trusted thing that we have. Yeah, but there is more trust in a computer that you might think of. For instance, there's Intel SGX, mm -hmm. which is an instruction set extension to x86. Oh, yeah. Which provides right. integrity and confidentiality of code and data in so-called untrusted environments, which are also called mm -hmm. enclaves. So what we can do is we can run programs in those enclaves using protected areas of memory. So even if the operating system is compromised, my data is still computed in a secure way and protected. So in that scenario, we can be an evil operating system and we okay. have more power by, do that, by doing that. 
And we even go one step further in order to reduce the measurement noise as, mini as a minimum as possible. We hook the SGX enclave exit point. So we start, so, so we record the current energy consumption. We jump into the enclave, we compute something. Whenever we immediately return from the enclave, we get our sample again, so we can see how much energy we have consumed within the enclave. Because then we can directly read them out from the MSRs, there's no overhead from the driver, and that's perfect, that must work, right? There's a comment that says uh, that one of us is not audible, we should probably check uh, who that is. Okay. But others but say... You're both, you're both audible. Oh, okay, then that's uh, probably... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm watching you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he also great. said sorry in the next message, so... <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, Moritz, but that means if there is no op operating system overhead, then this also means that the noise is gone. Yes, and at least this is what maybe, we're hoping for. Maybe we can also uh, do something more here because uh, you probably know these control channel attacks and there mm -hmm. have been several works uh, on that that um, try to perform very precise attacks on SGX by frequently interrupting the victim. And yes. we could do the same basically, right? Yeah, because if we do that, we artificially increase the resolution. Mm -hmm. By just letting the victim compute for a very short time and then measuring. Yes. And mm -hmm. as we can see, we, we tried it out. And it now the victim is perfectly there. I, I, I still don't see it. So we do I, some I we do some both processing, getting rid of some, some noises. And now you start recognizing like 8-bit blocks. So okay. it's way better than before. Yes. So you can leak keys that have 8-bit blocks. Of yeah, then, then you can compress them better if you want to store them. Yeah, but we cannot, we cannot leak a real key. No. So maybe, maybe we have to go one step further and really yes. uh, take a look at these control channels and the, the yeah, single stepping of en enclaves, what's possible there, taming the enclaves. And there's a framework that we can use for that. Uh, that is written by Jo van Burg from Karo Löwen, mm -hmm. and that is called SGX Step. And um, the basic idea is that SGX Step gives you a new um, new interface, basically through the kernel, through a kernel driver, and through this um, interface, you have a library uh, in user space with which you can directly. Uh, interrupt the enclave and handle those interrupts directly in user space. So what you do is with this library, you interrupt the enclave and then it gets an interrupt. Interrupt handler goes back directly into the library and uh, yeah, that's basically it. And then the enclave can, uh, the library can at any point resume the enclave. And with that, you can basically single step an enclave. So SGX step is an open source Linux kernel framework. You can download that from GitHub and it uses epic timer interrupts for that. And with that, you can not only, as I said before, a single step enclave execution, but you can also zero step enclave execution. Okay, how does that work? You start executing an instruction, but before the instruction is finished, you send the interrupt and the pipeline has to be flushed. And then you can, by the next time you send an interrupt, uh, the, sorry, the next time you, you start the enclave, you can again send an interrupt before the um, instruction in the enclave is finished. Okay. So this is pretty cool. So timing how much time the, um, the enclave gets, you can make sure that the enclave advances zero steps in the instructions. But, but this is perfect for our case. So we can just combine the Rupple interface with your SGX step framework. Because by doing that, we can measure the energy consumption of single instructions suddenly. And this sounds exactly what we're looking for. 
Not only that, we can repeat the measurement even as often as we like. Nice. And even if there is noise on there, this will average out over time. That so sounds pretty awesome. Okay. So, as we said in the beginning, the update interval of Rappel is rather low. So mm -hmm. when we execute an instruction, in fact, before we would receive an update to this MSR, we can measure or execute thousands of instructions. So we need to play around with that to optimize the limit of noise that we, we have. And there are different ways. For instance, we just execute it once and then we execute something else until we receive an update. Or we execute one instruction repeatedly, which is what we did in the beginning, where we have seen that we can measure energy differences between the operands or the instructions mm -hmm. in the end. But in this attack, we cannot really do that, but mm -hmm. only if we use zero stepping. We could also add those instructions with known instructions so that we more or less can guarantee that the rest of this interval always executes the same instructions, which consume the same amount of energy. So the only difference is our targeted instruction. And by using SGX step, we can even use it to reissue the same instruction within one update interval. So we can amplify okay. that. So now we know how to attack cryptographic algorithms. We use this zero stepping or single stepping. And with that, we get all the accuracy that we need, right? Yes, this is our plan. So what we did is we implemented a simple square and multiply algorithm where for the zero bit, we have only the square operation and for the one bit, as we've seen earlier, the additional multiplication. And mm -hmm. the idea is the different amount of energy that is consumed depends on the key bit that we are currently executing. And by combining our Rappel interface with SGX step, we can see here, we measured multiple times the same instructions. And in, in those blocks that you can see for red, we have the one bits for blue, we have the zero bits, or in this case, the other way around. And we can see a difference in the energy consumption of those blocks. So we can distinguish a one bit from a zero bit and therefore recover the secret key that is executed there. But okay. as I said, this is just a toy example. Can we attack real implementations? Of course, and we already did that, right? We attacked a uh, real RSA implementation um, as implemented in Ember TLS 2.13. And this one also uses a square and multiply algorithm. And uh, for this multiplication there, it uses the uh, AVX mem set. Yeah, and uh, there again, uh, the number of instructions executed depends on the key. And we just showed that we can exploit this and we can now attack uh, embed TLS with the same mechanism. If the keybit is a one, we perform a square and multiply. If the keybit is a zero, we perform only a square. And this translates uh, basically into a test and a jump. So far, no difference. But if we take a look at the square and multiply, we find this instruction sequence. And in case of the square operation, we find this instruction sequence here. And you can see the clear difference here. Uh, they are not the same. There is a clear difference here. If we run through that, um, there's already uh, a difference here, but maybe just the order. Here's a difference. Uh, this will probably have a different energy consumption, but also this one will also have a different energy consumption. And that means that we can uh, measure a difference between these two uh, branches in this algorithm. Yes, the, the important thing here is that, as Daniel outlined, the implementation is not constant time. So we execute a different number of instructions mm -hmm. for the one case as for the zero case. So what we yeah. need to track in our attack is that we start at the beginning, detect where we've executed as many instructions that we are now either in the one block or in the zero block. Then we 
observe if it has been a one bit or a zero bit. And by doing that, we know how many instructions we need to advance to measure yeah. the next bit. And for instance, here, we can use single stepping to speed up the attack by jumping over those instructions we do not want to observe. For instance, did the MOF or the subtract and only use zero stepping on those instructions where we are really interested in receiving those energy consumptions. Here, the AVX exactly. instructions. And, and we did that. If we, yeah, and if we show you the plot for that, um, actually, I, I think we have the wrong uh, title here. It still says RSA twice. Yes, right? that's true. My bad. Yeah. But that is a real plot. On embed TLS. Yeah. And, and as you can see, a clear difference between uh, the two cases here. Yes. Yeah. And there's like a, a drop in those energy measurements in the beginning because maybe the CPU powered down a bit and therefore the overall energy consumption is less than in the other cases. Yeah, we can still distinguish them because the exactly. difference is very clear. Because if you put the threshold right in the middle, it's still easy to distinguish. Mm -hmm. So as yeah. I said, the time of the attack increases linearly based on the index. Mm -hmm. And for a 512 private key, it took us three and a half hours. OK, but 512 bit is probably rather small for RSA. Yes, but we so... want to illustrate our point to show that we can attack real implementations. In our mm -hmm. case, the attack can also be optimized a bit more. So we have implemented an oracle that figures out what is our target instruction based on our previous re um, reconstructed key bits. And the way it is implemented is not the most efficient ones as we run an additional enclave on the site. And this took like almost a third of the attack just to figure out what instruction we need to attack. Yeah. OK, and, um, in this example, we recorded uh, three samples per key bit. Um, but also, um, you could extend this easily to a single trace attack, right? It's just single stepping. Yes. So if you configured the SGX step properly, you can, as we said, zero step individual instructions pretty good. Yeah. And therefore, it should be possible in one go. But luckily, this is just kernel to enclave. And if I keep my kernel secure, then this is not relevant for me, right? So I can't perform crypto attacks from user space, right? Yeah. So maybe we go back to the beginning, because mm -hmm. what we want to do in the end is to really attack cryptographic implementations from user space where we do not need to have any operating system. <laughs> privileges. And as we've seen, it's quite difficult to measure parts of programs without having this SGX step feature where we can just interrupt an enclave and measure one single instruction all the time. We cannot just do that with other applications running on the system. But what we can do is we can measure the overall execution of a program. But so for instance, that give us a crypto key, the overall execution. We will come to that. So there are different ways to attack using the power side channel. And one is so-called the correlation power analysis, where we start off with a model of our device. So we model the energy consumption of the device. And as we've mm -hmm. seen earlier, there's, for instance, the Hemming weight, which means the number of bits that are set for a value the, the more bits that are set, the higher the energy consumption is. So this is our assumption. Another possibility is the so-called Hamming distance. So you have, for instance, six bit set to one with the next instruction. You flip because of the operation like 20 bits. And the number of bits that you're flipping is the Hamming distance. And you can also say the more bits you're flipping, the higher the energy consumption will be of your instruction. So this sounds very similar to a differential power analysis attack, right? Yes. Yeah. In fact, this is a variation of that. Um, we can attack ASNI with that. 
Yes. Uh, ASMI is side channel resilient, basically, because it um, allows you to implement cryptograph uh, cryptographic algorithms that use AES um, with a constant time property. So you can make sure that the runtime is always the same as AES is implemented in hardware and it's constant time. Yes, but, but as I said, there's one downside in this attack is because the Ruttle update interval is limited, we can only mm -hmm. target AES and I, which consumes some cycles, only in scenarios where we can trigger the encryption and decryption of many, many blocks. Because otherwise, okay. if we would only run one AES instruction, we would still be in one Ruttle update interval. So we can target okay. disk encryption, for instance. Yeah, different examples, TLS. SGX enclave states, the sealing and unsealing uh, of the enclave state. Um, so there are different targets that we can attack here. Yes. So is there any requirement? Uh, so do we need to know the, is this like a known plain text, known cipher that's chosen plain text? Yes. So in our case, the way we mounted the attack is this mm -hmm the way that we control the plain text. So we can say, mm -hmm. please encrypt this plain text and give us a cipher text back. So we can also mm -hmm. observe the cipher text in that scenario. And what we do is we measure the energy consumption over many, many operations. And then we more or less guess the key. We will see that in a minute. Yeah. And the question is, with our energy model, as we've seen, for instance, the Hemingway to Hemming distance, and all possible values the key byte can have, where correlates it the most? And with a high mm -hmm. probability, where the correlation is the highest, this is our key bit. So maybe Daniel, you want to illustrate the attack in simple steps. Yeah, so basically uh, in the CPA attack, you have, as we said, the plain text, and then we encrypt it. So you get some encrypted text out and we measure the power consumption over this entire uh, procedure. Now, the energy consumption during different steps of the algorithm might vary. And now, if we modeled this correctly, um, then we later on will find this as the highest correlation between our predicted um, power consumption and the power consumption that we observed. Uh, for instance, if we uh, take this uh, this um, key uh, plain text stream, we don't know the key yet. Yeah, so, uh, so, yet. So, so, yeah. maybe to interrupt you for a second. The, the important yeah. thing is we want to attack this key, which consists of multiple bytes, and each yeah. byte can be a value from zero to two hundred and fifty-five, as we've seen. And, and we attack them separately. Each key yes. byte is attacked separately. Yes, this is of course uh, important. And when we start that, we will first uh, start with this, um, with the plain text uh, here, with this plain text byte uh, set to zero. And then we measure uh, or uh, predict um, what the energy consumption will be like. And for different um, bytes that we set, we will get different uh, values, both for the prediction and for the uh, measured energy trace. And now for one of them, uh, we can see that the predicted trace, um, this, one that we pred this one that we predicted here, and the one that we observed had a very high correlation. So this was Fe. So that means that this is probably the best candidate for the first key byte. And we can, can continue this with uh, all the other key bytes. And after a while, uh, then we will have all the key bytes figured out. Of course, as you've seen here, there might also be other good candidates. So we also have to keep them in mind. Uh, if the topmost candidate doesn't fit, then one of the next most likely ones might fit. Okay. So with that, we can attack the AES and I instruction set extension uh, that was actually uh, introduced to mitigate timing and cache side channel attacks. And we now can attack it with a different side channel attack. Yes, so we 
mounted the attack in, in two scenarios, one on the operating system where we used Intel's AES and I sample library, put it in a Linux kernel module and used IO control interfaces to communicate with this module. On the other hand, we also attacked an SGX enclave using the integrated performance primitives, but this time we didn't use SGX step, but we mounted the attack from user space. Okay, so we attacked an SGX enclave from user space. Yes. And get out the key. We will see about that. Okay, let's see how long it takes. Um, so for this attack, the runtime, uh, we can see both the trade number of traces and how long the attack runs for different scenarios. For the SGX scenario with minimal I.O. noise, we can see that it already runs 26 hours, requires 2 million traces. Yes. In well, real world conditions, it gets much worse, right? We get up to 200, uh, 277 hours and 16 million traces. For the kernel, it looks better again with 4 million traces and 50 hours. It's still a lot, right? Yes. But it seems to work. Have a demo for that that we will now yes. watch live. Okay. No. Well. <laughs> so what we see here after recording all those traces, we look through them and observe where the correlation is the highest. And on the left side, you see this for every of the 16 key bytes. On the right side, we chose one, I think the byte number five, and see a live update of our highest correlating key byte. And as we've seen in the beginning, it was jumping around quite often, but the more measurements we take into account, so we are close to 2 million traces, then it, the noise averages out. And here, as we can see now with the final plot, with high probability, we can say that this has been the correct key byte that we've recovered. And as we can see on the left, every recovered key byte from the round key is correctly recovered. So the attack works. Okay, very nice. Uh, but does that mean that everything is broken? Are we just screwed? No, because the, the, the way this bug has been introduced from user space is what are easy to fix. So mm -hmm. we just remove the unprivileged access to those MSRs. So okay. if you want to read the energy consumption, you need to have root privileges. And so this is the one line patch for the Linux kernel. Exactly. You can also patch hypervisors probably in a similar way, right? Yes. So for Xen, it has been patched in, in, in multiple mm -hmm. steps. In the first case, they just got rid of the Rappel MSRs. In the second step, they introduced an allow list to filter all the other MSRs that they also passed through to the guest machines. But the problem is that SGX still allows attacks from a compromised operating system. That's what yes. SGX wants to protect against. So the operating system patch does not help here. And we need something else, right? Yes. Microcode updates, maybe. So in that case, microcode updates have been necessary. And what they do is they fall back to a different model to measure the energy consumption. Because it, it, also in previous CPU generations, they did not report the exact energy consumption, but they had a model where they said this instruction uses this amount of energy and they will just report that. And in that case, we fall back to exactly this model. So with that in mind, we cannot distinguish data and operands anymore. So the important thing is that if you implement something, you still need to make sure that you have a constant time implementation, because as we've seen in, in our Ember TLS attack, we can attack those. And attacks on those do not change. So you need to have a constant time implementation where the microcode update protects you. And we also measured that and measured whether this helps, right? And it does, right? With the mitigation, yes. we don't see a difference anymore more between the operands. But if you use non-constant time crypto, it still leaks, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, but luckily this is just an attack that affects Intel CPUs, not everyone in the industry, right? So it's just the thing for Intel to fix and not for everyone else. Is that correct? Not entirely sure. So 
it okay. appears that my clicker still doesn't work, but AMD is also affected as well because they provide with the AMD energy driver a similar interface where you can read out those measurements from user space. So mm -hmm. they applied a similar patch as Intel where they removed this access from unprivileged user space, but in the next round, they just removed the interface entirely. So the driver is not there anymore. So you can so, just so use that it. Means that, so that means that I can't use any tools anymore for power efficiency? At, at the moment, no. Okay, at least the official awesome. driver is, is not used anymore. But mm -hmm. as we've seen in our examples in the beginning, we did the same thing on AMD. And it also allowed us to measure the energy consumption of different operands here for the shift right instruction, for instance. Okay. And this might be relevant for AMD as well, as they uh, also have some uh, trusted execution technology. Exactly. But back then, there was no CPU where a similar attack, as we've seen in the attack scenario on SGX, would have been applicable to AMD CPUs. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it does not really stop there. So we did not investigate them more thoroughly, but also other CPU vendors have also interfaced that, interfaces that allow you to measure the power. For instance, mm -hmm. some ARM development platforms, so the NVIDIA Jetson platform gives you the possibility to read with an even lower resolution than an Intel CPU, the energy consumption, or the Thunder X2 has an interface, Ampere Ultra, the Hygion CPU family, which is similar to the AMD CPUs, also give you access to similar interfaces. And so, also the Power9 from IBM. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if someone has time and is interested, he can. And has access to those machines, he can figure out mm -hmm. how much you can leak there. OK. So maybe let's also talk a bit about the timeline. And the timeline, of course, started with uh, the discovery of the Rappel interface. Yeah, actually around the same time, we also came up uh, with the idea that this would make a very cool talk. Uh, and we gave a talk at uh, CCC uh, uh, last year, last year um, on this attack with the title that we came up with back then. Uh, so that was also a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, first, toy attack on RSA and the Cobra channel actually worked in 2017 already. But there was one problem. It was not very convincing yet. The things that we could leak back then were not very realistic. A Cobra channel alone is not a good paper. Uh, so we decided to yeah, prioritize other things. I mean, this was around the same time we've worked on the, uh, or just after that, we started working on the Meltdown and Spectre papers, so we were busy for some time with other publications. 2018, early 2018, when uh, Meltdown and Spectre went public. Yeah. But we picked it up again. Yes. So, so we invested quite some time, even in 2017, in trying to get those yeah. single key bits out. But as we've seen, we could only leak blocks of key bits. But in 2018, we picked it up again and implemented the KSLR break and further reduced down the attack on RSA. But still, mm -hmm. we wanted to have a complete key and not fake keys that are not really realistic. And as Daniel said, Meltdown happened yeah. and works following that. But in the meantime, also frameworks like SGX that, uh, I mean, SGX that came out in 2017, but uh, we only um, got to know that framework later on. And uh, yeah, that was uh, very helpful also with the help from uh, Jo van Burg to uh, get started with that framework um, to build the full attack on RSA then. Um, yeah, November yeah. 2019, we submitted the paper uh, to a conference, uh, we started the responsible disclosure, and this was also the start of the embargo. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then we're already 2020. <laughs> that is, uh, maybe a, a nice fun fact for, for Red Hat is that they enabled the Rappel interface way later than, than other Linux distributions. So after mm -hmm. the disclosure, it was also accessible on Red Hat. And 
Yes, in November last year, the public disclosure happened with the patches coming out. Yeah, and then everyone patched their OSs and um, everything was mostly fine again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm um, fun I fact think... about the, maybe a fun fact about the first submission. This one actually got rejected from the conference and we resubmitted it to another conference then later on. Um, yeah, happens. Yeah. So I think the most important takeaway of this presentation is that power side channel attacks cannot only be exploited when you have physical access to machine, but you can also exploit them just by running software on your CPU. That's very nice because we still don't know how to use an oscilloscope and this allows us to mount these attacks now as well. Okay. <laughs> The threat model of SGX is still very interesting as it allows so powerful attackers uh, and that also then requires very complex mitigations. Uh, not just for this attack, but we've seen this uh, again and again and again for different attacks on SGX. Yes, and as we've seen, there are other CPU manufacturers which have similar interfaces, so those should be investigated as well to maybe find different types of leakage or different attack scenarios. So this work is discussed in more detail in our publication, the Platypus paper. You find them on the Platypus attack website. And it's important to highlight that not only we both worked on that, but it has been a collaboration with Andreas Kogler, David Oswald, Michael Schwarz, Catherine Easton, Claudio Canella, and the two of us. And we thank you for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions and discuss other attacks and other things that might be interesting for you. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, both of you. That was a fabulous <laughs> summary and as usual had all of your uh, typical flair and effects. So uh, <laughs> we appreciate that very much. Are you, are you switching back to your uh, regular camera, Daniel? We just see your- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm switching picture. back to the regular camera. I'll be back all right. in about 30 seconds. And then... so, so while you do that, I'll tell everyone, uh, um, if you have questions, you can either put them into the Q&A tab. It might be easier to do that in the uh, hop in uh, UI, you'll see a Q&A tab. Uh, it's uh, the fourth one. Uh, you can type in questions there and we'll try to get to them. Um, I was gonna make an observation, you know, the, the um, you know, power side channels and power analysis, right? There's, there's, uh, there's all kinds of fun stuff that you, 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 you find there. Um, power viruses are one that really excite me. You know, you can write malicious code sequences that uh, um, actually can be quite damaging physically to hardware. Have you, have you guys looked at, uh, you know, power viruses and other sorts of things as well that you want to talk about? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, these are fun because you get like, uh, you know, harmonic oscillations in, in the, in the pipeline, if you can, get it just right. <laughs> yeah, I think there was this magic paper that mm -hmm. simulated them and, and found some sequences they could run to wear down the, the CPU in the most efficient way, if you put it that way. Yeah, the, the main one I've seen is if you don't have, if you don't design your power distribution network just right, you can uh, cause a temporary uh, voltage uh, droop or spike that uh, yeah. basically crashes, yeah, crashes the machine. So that's kind of fun, that stuff. I guess Daniel has disappeared or he's, oh no, he's returning. There yeah, he is. Yeah. Hey. Okay, that works. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get to people's questions and then we can chat some more about uh, uh, memory lane and working together and all kinds of fun things. So let's see. Um, we had one actually, I think was very interesting. Somebody was asking about the granularity because of course, you know, modern pipeline and modern CPU, everything's out of order. Um, you, you know, uh, if you're using this raffle, fairly coarse grained interface, uh, how are you dealing with the, uh, you know, the, the back end of the machine being out of order? You want to walk uh, through uh, 
how that has an impact on sampling, you know, because you, you, you make a change to Rappel, okay, a bunch of instructions come, but you don't know which ones, you don't know how that's going to happen. So is it just, is it just uh, extensive sampling and, and uh, yes, you want to walk through that a bit? So there are two scenarios. So the, the one where we observe the difference in the operands, we had a very artificial example where we just have a tight loop over one instruction that, or uh, we, we copied them multiple times and, and measured them mm -hmm. to just figure out as a primitive example what we can actually leak with that. Because it was quite surprising that we could even leak the data values that are stored in the cache line. In, on the other hand, for the enclave scenario, we run into troubles like this because as we've seen, we do not only execute the instruction we want to target, but when we have the interrupt handler executed, we also, of, of course, measure them in addition. The nice thing with that is, is that those instructions are all the time more or less the same. So mm -hmm. let's say you have 200 instructions, which we cannot really control, but right. those are the same all the time. So in the end, it adds up as like a constant factor to your measurement. So with the values that we get out, there's an additional baseline where we start from, from all the instructions that are executed as well. That's super interesting. I mean, it's going to be implement. It's going to vary in, in an implementation, right? Because yes. I mean, you know, if you're basically saying, you know, um, forwarding networks, completion networks, all of that constant time, because they basically behave the same no matter what instruction. But if you were to um, you know, decode instructions as groups and do them a little bit differently. Uh, if your reorder buffer hand was different, you, you, it could be different in a different implementation. This might not work. Yeah. Um, we also have seen, seen differences in different micro architectures where we mounted the same attack. Of, of course, our, our, our sample set of different computers is rather limited. So we are happy that we had a cloud provider offering us some bare metal machines where it executed over a month. I think one additional nice fact is with LVI, where mm -hmm. as a mitigation, we have to add additional L fences after many instructions. Mm -hmm. This could also help to, to amplify the attack because then you say you're not allowed to execute any further instructions from that point. Yeah. Yeah, you're serializing the loads, so that, that exactly. really helps you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, the back end of the machine is now doing what I want. That's, that's great. Um, yeah. By the way, have you have you made maybe you maybe you have and you won't answer this, that's fine. Have you uh have you looked at uh, attacking microcode sequences with this as well? Because I think you could do some really fun stuff uh uh there as well. So I, I think as much as I can say is that we're working on some follow-up work in, <laughs> in, in directions. Yeah, man, I'm I'm jealous. I always I, I always love chatting with you guys because I think, oh man, this would be a fun thing to look at. And then... <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. One could wish we have more. We would have more time to do things. <laughs> there are all the time yeah. so many ideas you you could do. And as we've yeah. seen with a dex like this, sometimes you need to have it running to just record measurements for like a month, mm -hmm. which. It's usually a long time in contrast yeah. to other attacks that we've seen or that we've demonstrated where if it doesn't leak within a minute, something is wrong with the code. Yeah, it's also the difficulty to decide whether something looks promising enough to let it run for a month. Um, yes. Because if you would do that for everything, Right. Ninety-five percent or ninety-nine percent, maybe, of the things that we come up with don't work. Right? The, we only report the the one percent, maybe, that does work. Yeah, I think Stefan van Schaik said that for their initial LVI proof of concept, they had he like had it running while he was out for lunch, and when he came back, he had like one cache hit corresponding to a value. I'm going to just put in here, LVI is uh, load value injection for those who Was it or not. the IPOC? Maybe it was something else, but I remember yeah. something along those lines. And we did yeah. the same thing. We had some PSCs, and whenever we went for lunch, we just let them run because it doesn't hurt. Yeah, exactly. And then if you're lucky, you see something leaking and can investigate further. Yeah. But letting it run for a month is like, no. Nah. <laughs> Yeah, 
I'm just thinking, I'm imagining with, with, uh, you know, some of these attacks, I'm thinking, uh, uh, maybe I should ping you later and describe the micro code attack that I'm thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll do that when it's not being recorded, but I've got some really <laughs> fun ideas to just give it. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, so getting back other... maybe to the question of, of power viruses, I think this will be, uh, this, this might become more relevant as uh, hardware gets uh, smaller and more fragile. Um, and um, the, the question is what the threat model there exactly is. Because if you damage a CPU, you maybe cause some, um, some financial damage to the company that uh, rented out the machine to you. But probably they can trace back who ran the power virus in hindsight, and they can also uh, then just not rent out the machine anymore to other customers. The real problem, I think, would be if you could um, cause damage to the rep reputation of the company that rented you the machine uh, because their systems become unreliable. But it's not clear whether and, and to what extent you can actually do that. We know that from, from Rowhammer, actually, that if you hammer a memory location long enough, it will get uh, less stable. So probably that would be something that you can already do today. You could run a Rowhammer attack, let's say, for um, three months nonstop on some Amazon machine uh, mm -hmm. or any other cloud provider, and maybe uh, the this bit look this memory location this bit would get unstable it's not clear how well that works um there's no larger study that would investigate how long this takes on average um and i would also assume that the cloud providers could easily um recognize that um that that this problem um occurs now yeah, I think a lot of the CPU vendors are putting all kinds of, you know, I think I think one thing that's interesting for people to understand is is that uh, things like Rappel and, and these other telemetry interfaces, they build on features that you have to have in a CPU. So in a, in a modern processor, you have to have what are called dig digital power meters. Um, yeah. You actually have to track how much every instruction is using because uh, your dynamic voltage frequency regulation uh, uh, control loop has to has to carefully track that if you if you if you don't if you exceed even for a brief few nanoseconds your power budget you can actually crash the, the yeah yeah uh, yeah that was that was actually surprising when working on plundervolt uh, that was one thing that we observed that we had two um basically identical cpus but they mm -hmm. had a different, so, so all the all the numbers were basically the same, but they had a different baseline voltage, a different yes. base voltage. And uh, effectively, if you would run a benchmark on two CPUs, uh, depending on the room temperature, if the room temperature is low, you would not see a difference maybe. But right. if the room temperature is high enough, you would actually see a performance difference between them. That's right. Yeah. And that's the same clock frequency. Everything looks the same. And the voltage is not something, the base voltage is not something that is that is reported there uh, before you before buying the CPU. Right. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? The sort of physical characteristics. Yeah. There's a lot of hidden information that that uh, you know is not disclosed as part of the uh, this is what they call the binning process, right? You have all these parts that you manufacture and you measure them at manufacturing, what they call OSAT outsource assembly and test. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say, oh, it has all these characteristics. Okay, and it, it, you know something hidden gets programmed, a fuse somewhere or something, and and uh, the platform knows all this stuff, but you, the user, have no idea that you know one chip might have these requirements, another chip might have these. Yeah, mm -hmm. very interesting. Very interesting. Um, uh, so let's see. Let's see some more questions uh, before we uh, talk about some more other things. Um, so we asked about the instruction granularity. Somebody said, what's the practical bandwidth um, of such a channel? So I suppose this was when you were doing the covert, just the producer consumer mm -hmm. communication using Rappel. Um, how much bandwidth did you did you get? The covert uh, channel is great to, to, to measure the bandwidth of a side channel because it gives you the least constraint scenario yeah. for, for leakage. So yeah. now it's what bandwidth did we achieve there? 
I, I would need to look it up, but to be honest, the, the way we implemented this was to just prove a point that there's a channel, you can exploit mm -hmm. it in that way, but it's not optimized in, in any way. As we've seen, we are just distinguishing uh, one bit from a zero bit, but what we could easily do is like to have not two differences in the energy consumption, but multiple steps where we encode multiple bits at the same time. Yeah. So for instance, if you want to encode one and one, we have a way higher energy consumption if you just have the first bit set a bit lower. Yeah. If the second bit set also a yeah. bit lower. And with that, you get into the all the all the techniques from uh, telecommunication uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you from can use to build coding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you guys will have fun with quantum computers, right? Because you'll have so many different states in each bit that you can. My, my Schrodinger team, will love you. <laughs> if they, if they at some point come up uh, as a as a broad, uh, broadly used platform, I, I, I'm skeptical of that. But yes, we'll see if it if it's Same, ever happens. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Let's see. So somebody, uh, we had a couple of questions on Twitter after that. Somebody asked, uh, we've had attacks on caches and branch predictors with Spectre and Meltdown, and recently microcode engines. Uh, which part of the microarchitecture do we need to worry about next? And that's from uh, our good friend Simon uh, mm -hmm. on Twitter. I so in general, if you take a look at uh, the different attacks, you you see a pattern there that uh, we learn more about some microarchitectural element, and then you see a range of attacks. For instance, with the L1 cache. Uh, you saw first uh, some L1 cache attacks like uh, Edict in Time, then something like Prime and Probe later on, uh, Flush and Reload then on the last level cache, then Prime and Probe on the last level cache. And we learn more and more about these elements um, also because of the, I think because the communities are a bit disconnected. So in many cases, if you would explain uh, what we found out about how architecture works to a computer architect, they would say, yeah, that's that's obvious. That's how mm -hmm. a computer works. And the the difference is that uh, if you approach it from a security perspective, you suddenly see different things. If you are looking for where's where's the the loophole that I can exploit, then then you approach it very differently. Um, and if you take a look at Spectre and Meltdown, this is still there's still some connection here with with cache attacks, I would say, um, in particular for Meltdown, now that we know that, uh, I mean, we have uh, worked on this for, for several years now, now that we know that Meltdown really can just leak from the L1 cache by its own, but there are other effects that assist Meltdown in leaking things from somewhere else, but the technical effect only leaks from L1, it is related to the L1 cache again. And I would expect that the same thing happens with other uh, parts of the microarchitecture as well. So now we've seen the first um, rather simple uh, side channel attacks on the microcode engines. We will see uh, more powerful attacks next, and then more powerful attacks and more powerful attacks. And as CPUs also change over time, uh, for instance, uh, attacks that were possible on Nehalem CPUs didn't work anymore on um, Sandy Bridge and uh, subsequent CPUs. Um, but on the other hand, then new attacks were possible. For instance, the reverse engineering of cache slices suddenly became a relevant part and uh, also allowed uh, for new attacks where you can observe differences between cache slices. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think... And, and you, you said before... It's not necessarily we, we... the next, next element that we, that we need to worry about, but CPUs evolve and it will be the same elements again and again and we will add more elements to our toolkit um, but uh, then um, we will find problems with the same elements again and again we, we discussed before uh, uh, and uh, it, it's come up in public now so I'll mention it the uh, you know uh, uh, value prediction right it's, mm, as yeah. an interesting uh, target that that yeah. you, you know everyone knew that this was being researched, but it wasn't implemented in practical designs, except for mm -hmm. things like, you know, zero store elimination, which we yeah. saw just this week is a feature that has been disabled in one vendor's uh, design because, uh, you know, you can use that for, um, you know, as a, as a 
to build gadgets and leak information, right? But but I think that's another area where you can just yeah. look out in the future and say, oh, you could build all kinds of uh, you know value yeah. predictors, but um, they're not there yet. But they, when they are, yeah. Uh, yeah. you'll have fun. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. but this is uh, from an academic perspective, I think this is a bit, um, it's difficult to find the right point in time when to work on that, because if it's not in a product yet, um, it will be difficult to f actually find an audience. Um, and and there's, there's sort of this dilemma that, that you, on the, ones, on the one hand, you want to find these vulnerabilities before they are in products, but on the other side, uh, you, if you want to publish your results, it has to have some relevance. Uh, so I, the right Daniel, point I think, in time is difficult to find. I, I, I don't know. I don't, don't completely agree with that because we've seen with the attacks that there are ways how you can implement things. And I think with all those attacks we've illustrated, they should be implemented in a different way and not mm -hmm. to forward data all the time. And the same applies for value prediction. So I think there's a, a good point in time to, to make the argument again, that if you implement it, do it right. <laughs> if you can do that, it yeah. really depends from which domain you want to protect and which attacks you want to protect from. But that is my personal opinion. So I think there's, it's a good point in time because of people working at different companies now that it makes sense to maybe do something in that direction. But the I issue, on the other hand, is there is no implementation. There are some academic implementations you might don't get access to. So you would need to start from scratch. Yeah. And think... there has been tons of research done in that direction, how you can implement them. And, and also, this wouldn't make a, a convincing argument if we say we implemented a value prediction on our own. And now we show that our own implementation is broken. Yeah, it's not a convincing story. Well, you, Daniel, you had mentioned this before when we when we used to talk about. Uh, yeah, I think I think the audience uh, may may not have this context. You know, we ha we have here uh, two two researchers in a in a team that, that find very interesting uh, vulnerabilities and and also do a lot of other academic research and teaching and many other things. But um, it, it the, the 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 struggle of publishing, right? Because you would love nothing more than to go and research very novel uh, things that maybe haven't even been built yet. But um, you sometimes, you know, write a paper and people people will tell you, oh man, no, I'm not accepting that paper. It can't possibly be true. And you have to convince people that the thing that you have found is actually, a, you know, a true thing. So um, the struggle of the publishing virtuous cycle in academia is a, is a real challenge because if you want to get recognition, you also have to publish and then you advance your career. So um, you don't get too far ahead of, of, of things that exist in the real world. It's an interesting I, struggle. I, I mean, I yes, to some extent, it, it's a struggle. But um, to some extent, I also really like the publishing part uh, because it's also something that checks whether what you do has relevance. And if you publish in really good venues, then you'll publish it only there if it had, if others say it has enough relevance. Um, and I think that's a good indicator that you're looking at the right things also. Um, but of course, uh, if, uh, if you wouldn't need to publish, then maybe some things in research would work differently. Um, but at the same time, I, I had this really good conversation with a PhD student from uh, Ingrid Verbal Vede and, and Ingrid, um, and uh, she told uh, her PhD student uh, that um, because the PhD student was about to, to, to add more and more content into a paper, and uh, she was basically saying that publishing uh, just means that you share your current state of knowledge and you need to make a cut and you need to publish what you know now and you can't always defer uh, this to a later point and say I add more things because now I know more and uh, you, you have to at some point publish what you know now and this is I think an important part and therefore I also like publishing what we know it at some point. I think for, for, for me, it's very similar to teaching, basically. I want to teach the students what I know about, for instance, operating systems. Um, and uh, 
it's it's similar with the publications you want to share with others what you know yeah we had another question here uh about uh, somewhat related uh mm -hmm. modeling uh, so, okay, maybe you don't uh, go and build a brand new, you know, value predictor and then attack it, but um, there is value in, <laughs> I guess that's pun intended, there is value in, uh, in having uh, modeling and the ability to uh, detect uh, design flaws and so on. Um, are, are there things that you think uh, could and should be done there uh, for people to design more robust implementations in the future? I mean, I think if you can model the leakage, and then have a formal proof that your implementation does not leak, this will be really helpful. But on the other hand, sometimes you don't know what can leak. Yes. Right. And, the, and if you don't know exactly how to model that, so, so there has even been a, a paper right after Melton and, and Spectre mm -hmm. where they modeled that, but if you didn't model it in, of course, you would find it because you just modeled it in. But if you don't know that the leakage you want to model, mm -hmm then it's quite hard and I think with all those things we have now even the state is already exploding to some extent mm -hmm. I was so thinking I'm... about uh, you know uh, gem 5 right they've added these uh, uh, you know energy cost model analysis and all this uh, stuff there so they have these uh, you know mm -hmm. sim objects for each instruction going through and you can add you know values and so on but but it, like you said, it's how fine grained are you in this? Because uh, you, you, maybe you know that you know an ad costs this, and if you have these parameters, it costs that. Maybe you can add that. But then, I don't know. The leakage could be in in uh, uh, you know forwarding results somewhere else, and you didn't model that piece, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. The problem. So there, there is a lot of progress in this field, um, and I've I've worked with, uh, for instance, Marco Guarnieri and uh, with uh, Frank Piesens also. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of uh, progress on the formal side. Um, the, there was a best paper at I, IEEE um, Security and Privacy by uh, Marco uh, this year, which won the best paper award uh, on hardware software interfaces and making them more secure um, with, with formal guarantees. I think there's a lot of progress, but also there we are currently working on a paper where we argue um, that um, you basically need uh, multiple layers of research to uh, keep up um, with the security demands that we have today. You need to explore what is possible. As soon as you know what is possible, you need to formally model it, and then you need to build secure implementations that follow these formal models. Um, and this is basically, uh, you, you need all three steps. If you stop exploring, your formal models won't be uh, up to date. And this is what we see again and again with, uh, we, we've seen that with cache attacks, where people said, well, we can model all the cache attacks and then new cache attacks were found and then when meltdown was found and this was not modeled. Um, yeah. Um, and, and now we have, uh, uh, somebody last night was just reminding me about, uh, building large SRAM structures and stacking them and, and the Intel, uh, AMD had their vCache announcement, right? So that, that's a novel new kind of yeah. uh, cache organization that I'm sure you guys will go and look at and say, oh, this is of interesting. Course. You know? of yeah. Course. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. it was the same thing with the way predicted that AMD has even for quite some time, but no one really took that into account. But it's also leakage that is there and has not been considered before. The problem is uh, when people often ask, why don't you just model all of this? I mean, you have the source code of the processor. Why don't you model the entire thing? If you would model the entire thing, you would run the actual CPU. And you wouldn't know where to look, right? That's right. Uh, and also the complexity, we don't, we don't, we can't compute that anymore. Uh, the model checking uh, approaches that we have work for small systems, uh, not for a full CPU. And I think I was actually just listening last night. Um, uh, Ian Cutras uh, did an interview with Jim Keller that I, I thought uh, was very interesting. And if those are, if, if people listening haven't seen it, go check out his uh, Tech Tech Potato uh, YouTube channel. It's quite interesting. It's quite fun. He uh, 
he's a journalist by day, but he does these fun interviews and other things as well. And uh, he and Jim were chatting about the uh, complexity of future processors and, and current processors and these abstraction layers. And I, I really think what Jim said was resonated very well that, you know, they have these defined interfaces. So it's not the case that, you know, anybody understands the whole processor anyway, right? You have a hundred yeah. people working on the front end, a hundred on the back end, and they have a defined interface. So, yes. um, right. And, and that's where the things go wrong, right? Because mm -hmm. you make security assumptions uh, about how things behind this interface work. Um, I don't know, there will be an interrupt. And after this interrupt, uh, my data will not be visible anymore. And on the other side, they also comply with the interface, but don't, don't take into account that uh, someone might still access something in flight. Right. Right. It's very interesting. I think maybe maybe the, uh, the, 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 the definition of the, the, the interface there has to change to include not just, you know, the values and performance characteristics, but also the leakage. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's a problem, right? Because if you include everything that this that makes this interface, you're at the source code level again, you can model the entire thing then again. And uh, yeah, you take away the nice thing of the ab abstraction layer that exactly. you have a simple interface for a complex exactly. thing. So I think it's an inherent problem that we have with abstraction. And it's not just, I mean, it's not just computers. Um, I, I really like that the understanding of side channels um, has, um, has evolved in the past uh, two decades from, ah, this is a way to get keys out of crypto algorithms from smart cards um, right. to something much more generic where you can also talk about uh, side channels and connect it to other parts, to side channels in card games, to side channels in that, that we know for many years uh, from psychology, like if you, the, the, the movement of the eyes, the way people speak, the way people move um side channels are everywhere we're, we're gonna fix that right uh, with these uh, deep learning uh, gpu uh, models they're gonna not only really move our eyes but remove all of our side channels from our video well, while we're speaking well sad, sadly sadly a static is, picture sadly i think this is this is the part uh, that uh, that surveillance technology actually leads to that people will try to be more side channel resilient in their behavior yeah, and yeah. as with uh, implementations in software or hardware, there's a behavior change that makes it more side channel resilient. Speaking of resilience, somebody had, had brought up the, uh, uh, you know, the sort of question around, uh, you know, branchy versus branchless crypto code and the, the choice of embed TLS that you had, and it had different, you know, well, it, it was not timing invariant uh, to start with. And I was saying in the chat, Yes, but they're picking something just to just you got to pick something to attack, right? It's just to, to prove the point. Yeah. Um, do you want to speak a little bit more about, uh, you know, sort of how you pick the, the targets and, and uh, you know, the, 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 you know, timing invariant properties, say, of that embed TLS library and, you know, uh, how you would proceed in the future differently, maybe? So, so I, I think one point that, that connects to this is what Daniel said in the beginning that we also need to publish. And to, to be honest, sometimes I think it's it's not the right thing to do. But sometimes papers get rejected because they even don't have a CVE or they just attack something artificial. That, that also happened with our paper. I can happily discuss that. So we we had the artificial implementation of the attack, and later on we also had the AES and I attack, but it still got killed because we had one toy example. But I, I think from an academic perspective, it makes more sense to prove a point to show that there's leakage there that can be exploited rather than pick a real world implementation that is even ported to, to SGX. So maybe you need to port it yourself, which adds a lot of overhead on your time. Just do that and then do attack that and then just disassemble it and, and see how the compiler actually translates the instructions what you what you can attack and in that case it was <laughs> um, good for us that it, it used AVX for instance because it was available on that CPU if it wouldn't have been there it would have been more complicated to do and and with those attacks 
it, it's also hard to, to evaluate because as we've seen in, in the long run time that you have no guarantee that it will leak that way so you or, or the way we, we do it usually we try to find like a minimal example and and make our way there and in, in that case it was like a minimal example and then it more or less exploded with having the embed dls implementation mm -hmm. and i think that's the point right is, is 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 your job is not to go and identify every vulnerable implementation in the world your job yes. is to say this is a class of attack i want you to really think about now right you go find yes. other people can find it whether they're researchers or or you know in industry um yeah, that, that was also one point. So for the embed DLS implementation, it's not constant time. So we also looked at, for instance, spare SSL, which only gives you constant time implementations. And we also had some leakage there, but the, the runtime would have been so immense. Yeah. And we only picked like one particular function, which we manually found that would leak information and just targeted that and didn't have an, a full end to end attack. But yes, I agree with you. It's not my point. It's nice to have, and I think it's important to say, okay, people actually implement it that way. Yeah. It, it's the same with T-tables implementations. They sadly are still used. There, there are Come many on. software projects that use those implementations still, even if everyone knows that they are completely vulnerable. Coming back to uh, complexity, uh, this, this is a follow on question, I guess. Uh, um, Daniel, you said that effectively, you know, these designs are becoming so complex that uh, mm -hmm. it's very hard to understand them. And, uh, you know, that, that leads to unforeseen side channels and so on. Uh, yeah. I often have spirited debates uh, with, with people around, uh, you know, enclaves and confidential computing. Uh, it, it's a timely topic, I think, in the, the, the current days. So I'll put my opinion out there. My, my, my own opinion is that, um, you know, there's a lot of well-intended technology to run, uh, you know, enclaves or confidential computing on the same CPU that other code runs on. Uh, I have a slightly controversial opinion that, that it's not possible to build secure machines that way and that you have to physically have separate uh, simple cores doing the work somewhere else. Um, What's your opinion on, on, on this and, and uh, where we go in the future? So I think, I think uh, it's not wrong to say that uh, having separate machines gives you security. But on the other side, for me as a researcher, it would be boring, right? I want to have, <laughs> I, want, I, I want to have a challenge. I, I, I would like to see systems with, I don't know, eight SMT cores, even though SMT today maybe is not as secure as not using SMT. Uh, but I want to see a future version of SMT that is secure. I want to see um, the possibility to share caches without the side channels, all of this. Uh, we need that for efficiency. Uh, we, we can't just scale down the micro, the, 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 um, the architectures more and more. We can't just scale down to, to an arbitrary uh, low, arbitrarily low number of uh, nanometers or then picometers or something. Um, and we won't be able to scale up the frequency um, without consuming way more energy. Um, and even there we will hit limits. So the only way that I see in the future to make systems more efficient, and we need to do that, um, is to make the microarchitecture more complex, more optimizations yeah. for special cases to save more energy. Um, and on the other side, we need to get more efficient at writing software again. Uh, we need to train our current students in software development and computer science to build more efficient software. Uh, we need to build frameworks and compilers and um, also operating systems that help the developers here in making things more efficient. And this means more complexity for all these parts because we need optimizations for all the small parts that are inefficient right now. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, that's a hot button topic of mine in, 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 uh, in uh, going down the stack. I keep uh, trying to write a, uh, 
uh, a blog post on on uh, hello world all the way down and i've spent weeks going through you know gem 5 models and this thing is taking forever to write but i sort of want to uh i i really do want to see people coming into industry who you know yeah you can write code in python that's fine you know use your language of choice but um just having a bit more awareness of what happens <laughs> when that code runs <laughs> um you yeah. know uh, yeah I, I mean, I, I think it gets even worse with that because not only with like cryptocurrencies where people just mine <laughs> the energy bill up as much as they can, but on the other hand, with like machine learning, it's not like I need to implement anything anymore. I just say, here are my pictures, do some magic, consume tons of energy, be as inefficient as you want, and give me my output. But for me, I didn't invest a lot in, in doing so. But, and I think but, those goes along all those ways. Yeah, but this is also a question of how how much we can uh, afford here, given the current situation. In terms of microarchitecture, is getting more complicated. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that one as well. Then, so you know, there uh, I agree. By the way, I think you end up having to get more complex to mm -hmm. to address these issues and also get performance. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be very challenging, right? There was a proposal recently. Oh, we can fix all the cache. Uh, uh, side channel analysis uh, uh, problems by adding these extra cache states so that, uh, you know, every time somebody um, touches the cache for the first time, there's a temporal indication and everybody, everybody takes a hit, uh, a, a miss hit, uh, a, sorry, a miss cost <laughs> the first time they, uh, they touch something, whether it's in the cache or not. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, well, that could work, but you've just destroyed the value uh, of, of, of having that in the cache. Uh, I mean, maybe not in the future, I guess if there's some, if you use it again, okay, yeah, you get, you always get the benefit the second time, but it sort of destroys the value of having the cache in the first place that, you know, my, my, uh, uh, you know, so, so what do you think about these kinds of things? Does that, is... Yeah, uh, the solution will not be to, uh, to get uh, rid of uh, the um, efficiency and performance mechanisms that we have right now. Um, and on, on the contrary, if we have the choice between, I mean, I mean, the, there's some, there, there was a study some, uh, years ago, I think in, was it in nature? Um, or I, I think something like that, that, um, which predicts that the energy consumption of, uh, global ICT, um, will increase to 25% of all ec electricity consumed, uh, on the planet in by 2030 and maybe earlier depending on how cryptocurrencies go and depending on how machine Hopefully they go goes. away <laughs> <laughs> yes but uh, we we might be there earlier unfortunately but if our ict consumes 25 percent of the energy on the planet uh, or electricity on the planet mm -hmm. um then we definitely need to talk about uh what we what we can do and if we need to reach i mean governments all around the planet uh, basically announced that they want to reach a co2 net zero by what was it 2045 by the latest um and uh, if we want to reach that we have to think about what we can do and in the worst case what i think will happen is that we will just decide, oh, we can't afford security here. Uh, mm -hmm. We will have uh, efficient CPUs. We can't afford the security and that's it. If we don't have hope... efficient security mechanisms, we won't have security, that's it. I hope though, with all these power meters that we have, you know, the, the, the average modern CPU knows exactly mm -hmm. to the instruction granularity, every single instructions energy cost. And so, it's possible they don't expose it today <laughs> and you're working on getting them to remove it. anyway <laughs> but let's say there's a safe way to expose um you you could actually say this is exactly how much energy every instruction in your program costs including the memory including everything else right yeah and i i've often loved this idea that you know you don't just bill people for you know you had a virtual machine and you ran it for this many hours but actually uh, this is what you're, I'm billing you based on the energy cost of what you did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, uh, you would see, I think, people moving very quickly from, uh, you know, um, Python to 
<laughs> something else or, or, you know, people would very quickly uh, optimize their code. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is that an interesting idea? I, I think so. Yeah. I think this will be the direction where research will go in the future. Yeah, I, I think many people are not aware of the energy they consume on a day to day basis. It's not even on programs, but it's like in their daily life. Yeah, hey, I live in America, man. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we, we love to waste energy. If we can do it something wastefully, we will do it. You know, uh, I think you were saying at the beginning, your, your room is, uh, you know, 20, 27 degrees or something like that uh, right now. I, I'm now at 32. Uh, well, <laughs> it's summer saying. here and, uh, I'm wearing a, you know, a thick, heavy, you know, winter, uh, you know, long sleeve shirt and, uh, the room because is, it's, uh, it's too cold for you. <laughs> it's 63 degrees Fahrenheit in this room. So this says, uh, I, 29. Oh yeah, 29. 29.6. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm also yeah. not lying. <laughs> <laughs> so it, any, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up in a minute, but um, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's been fabulous as always to have you guys uh, join us. And I, I wanted to give you a chance before, uh, before we close, just to let you have any final you know, this is the end of the Jerry Springer show. We've all learned something today. So uh, tell us what you learned and uh, um, give us some part of the parting thoughts. Eddie Moritz, you want to go first? You're looking for a job, right? Uh, you're you're on the market and available. Yes, I'm hopefully defending my thesis in the beginning of August, and then I'm looking for new opportunities and new challenges. And, and uh, by the way, what sort of challenges are you looking for? for people who are watching. Interesting ones. <laughs> I mean, I would love to continue research in that direction, but it can also be from a industry side and not only from an academic perspective. But I'm up for many things. I mean, as a fun fact, when I started as a student, I taught some courses and the only topic I didn't touch was side channel attacks because that was like pure magic for me. <laughs> But and now I had... ended up doing that. Yes, <laughs> that's the yes. only thing you did work on. <laughs> for, for my master thesis, it was like you can do cache attacks or some crypto implementation. So, like cache attacks sounds interesting. So you you never know what's coming, and if, if there is an interesting problem, I'm up for it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. But it, in the end, you you approach something that looks like magic, and then you figure out it's not magic at all. It's basically just doing some computations, following some algorithm. Daniel, what would you say for people who are listening? Uh, is your your takeaway? Uh, maybe maybe give people some thoughts on, you know, they're interested in in your research. They've heard about Spectre and Meltdown. They've they've seen the Platypus uh, website with uh, the usual mm -hmm. flair and uh, uh, the the wonderful way you guys present. I mean, it's amazing. I love how you present things. Um, is there is there a parting thought you had, and then maybe for both of you, um, uh, things that you would suggest to people who are interested in learning more or getting more involved? So getting more involved in uh, side channel things, I'm currently preparing a uh, an online course. So Theo Graz is uh, preparing something there, but it's not uh, public yet. Um, and uh, there we will have one course probably about uh, side channel security. And we will run there through roughly 30 examples where you can practice all kinds of uh, different side channel attacks, cache attacks, uh, raw hammer attacks, uh, um, power side channel attacks, all of it. And you can try that on your own. And uh, I think that's a, that's a good idea to, I, I think there's a lot of value in educating people, uh, both uh, experts that are already in the industry and are experts in their field just to give them this additional perspective that uh, this is how you could attack it. And this yeah. is probably one of the most valuable things we can do there because they will build better systems that at the same time also cannot be attacked with the known ways anymore. And this is, this is the next step that we need to reach there. And also uh, educating the the new generation to 
um, to build more efficient systems, um, both on the hardware and software level. Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. No, I, I think to add to that, I think it's very important that software engineers learn a bit more about the underlying hardware, mm -hmm. because there's this interface, and what's beyond that, no one mm -hmm. really cares, mm -hmm. more or less. Now yep. maybe some people do more, and I think the other aspect is. For instance, with, with all those performance optimizations, they make sense from an optimization point of view. But if you look at it from a security perspective, suddenly everything like crumbles and it's like, oh, you should have never done that. This is completely dangerous. Mm -hmm. But but before that, it was like no one can observe that, so it's not an issue at all. Yeah. And I, I think to get this security mindset a bit more in, in the architecture's head, would also help to, to improve that on, on the long run. I mean, mm. for instance, AMD also published a white paper a couple of months ago of another predictor where they also said, okay, there's a new predictor. You could do that and that and that in that perspective, but it's isolated from each, each con context you're running in. Yeah. I, I think it's a, a step ahead for, for the future where things should be going. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an interesting, I mean, that's another hot button for me because I, I have this, uh, I like to think of myself as a hardware person who lives in a software company. And so I often, uh, you know, find myself sort of, you know, yelling inside and outside, hey, uh, <laughs> you know, we should care more about uh, what's happening underneath because it's, it's actually code runs on computers and they turn out to be very important. You know, software is great, but um but I think, I think traditionally, you know, the, the um, crypto community was actually pretty educated about, you know, things like, uh, you know, cash line layout and, uh, you know, design your S-Box in the right way so that somebody can't in, monitor. In the early things. days, in, definitely in the early days, but since then, hardware has gotten so much more complex. And exactly. You, you find the, the more um, advanced attacks rather in, in general purpose domains and yeah. attacks that break uh, case well, they know about their S box and their system. and their cache lines. They don't know that there's a way predictor that's then you know that they're trying to do all the right thing, but they don't yeah. understand this other nuance. But, but, but I mean, even to illustrate that better, if you have like a smart card like your credit card, there are so many mitigations in there against mm -hmm. all financial attacks because yes. this is like where everything started. Yes, and then you have this small, simple thing in contrast to a modern CPU, and mm -hmm. now you want to protect the modern CPU with the same techniques. This, there's a huge gap in between. Yes. Yeah. Do you um, think uh, for people who want to learn more? I mean, uh, you yeah. know, obviously there's there's uh, uh, there's Open ISAs, there's Risk Five, there's uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, you can get uh, interesting implementations that you can play with and so on. And there's great modeling tools like Gem Five out there, and you can do all this stuff. Uh, are, there, are there particular favorites that you have that you would say, yeah, go play with this or go look at that? Um, so from from our perspective, we approach a lot of these things uh, basically from the from the software perspective. We we have a stronger education in on the software level. Uh, we also have some education on the hardware level, but uh, in general, my group is more on the software side. And for many of these things, we we start by seeing the leakage from the software layer and then trying to figure out what could this be, what type of element could it be, what does this element do. And then we slowly figure out what it is or what it is not. And initially, we very often have a theory in the beginning, oh, it's this, and then figure out, no, no, it's not. Usually, we, we have a much more exciting theory in the beginning what it could be and then realize it's much more simple. <laughs> um, maybe one more thing to add on, on education, as you said, uh, it's important that people learn about the layers underneath. This is actually um, something that I'm uh, that I've been doing for several years in in uh, our education at TU Graz with the with the operating systems class, for instance. And students, every year there are some students that ask, "Why do I have to learn this? I don't want to have. I, I don't want to become an operating system developer. I don't want to learn this." We did and, that 50 years ago. It's all old fashioned. Nobody cares. Yeah, it's a little exactly, rust now, baby. Exactly. <laughs> we, we don't need this anymore, right? And uh, this is 
now I, I think we will more and more realize that this view does not get us anywhere because we need to know how to write efficient uh, software and hardware. Um, and for the software layer, if you don't know how the operating system works, you, you can't write efficient software. It's not possible. And I, I think, it, it, yeah, it's, an, it's interesting because, uh, you know, there's, there's, what is it? There's sort of six or eight instructions that, that represent about 80% of programs that matter. And then there's all yeah. these others and each one has all these costs and you can go through and understand, you know, uh, uh, but I, I, yeah, I, I sort of want to see, I want to see this peeling of the onion. You know, you take your, you take your source, you look at yes. what it's compiled into, you look at these instructions. Okay. This is how they run. And, um, yeah. 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 You should uh, always understand the next layer to some extent, at least. Yeah. And then you just have to stop at a certain point, but I, I agree though. It's good to understand yeah. that there's something, you know, uh, always something underneath wherever you get to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And over the years, you will understand more and more about the next layer. And then the layer completely changed in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. Also happens. Okay, well, that's great. this has been great. I think we're we're at time. I haven't seen any more questions, so I'd just like to uh, once again thank our our two guests today, uh, Martin Slip and uh, Daniel Gruss uh, from uh, uh, Tia Grass. Uh, I'm afraid my uh, bad uh, pronunciation of of any words uh, of people's names because uh, uh, you know I live in America, so you know I always put your names. But uh, anyway, thank you for hosting us. <laughs> Really enjoyed uh, hanging out with both of you again. It's been a yeah, many year same. journey. Of... Yes, it would be great if we can do that in real time again. Yeah, I, I, yeah first yeah. time I can get to Europe, I'm going to see my family and then I'm going to come see you guys. That's the sequence. Perfect. <laughs> Beers on me. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> see you. Have Bye. A day. Bye. <laughs>